Hi! So today we're going to be discussing how to write good matching items for your content knowledge instruments this week. So matching items consist of knowledge of related facts, associations, and relationships. And you're going to match one column, the premises, with column two, which we're going to call the responses. And the columns must be homogenous. So this is the key to writing a good matching item, that both column one and column two should be homogenous. Um, and fill in the blank with a word bank is a subset of matching items. So instead of having two columns, you could have a set of fill in the blank items with a word bank at the top. And that's essentially the same thing as a matching item, right? So what are some advantages of matching items? Um, they're easily and objectively scored. So um, just like our other kind of um, selected response items, um, you can get a good sampling of items. You get a lot of item sampling within a short amount of time. And you can survey a, a large amount of items with matching items. Um, some disadvantages of matching. Um, you must have a sufficient amount of homogenous material. So it's really hard to kind of get a lot of matching material depending on your content area. So matching doesn't work for every content area or for every topic within your content area. Um, and it doesn't measure deep understanding or application. I have yet to figure out how to measure this with any kind of deep understanding or application. So a lot of your matching items are really at that surface level, content knowledge, maybe comprehension level. However, if you need to measure <laughs> knowledge or comprehension, matching is a good way to get a lot of that done in a short amount of time. Your students can answer them quickly and you can, um, you can write them quickly. Um, so let's talk about some guidelines for writing good matching items. Um, you want to make sure the directions are clear. Um, you want to use letters in the right column to write their matching letter in the left column. Um, rather than having them draw lines to match the two columns together, that can be really confusing. It's really hard to grade as a teacher. And also, um, if a student makes a mistake and they're erasing or crossing out lines, that's a nightmare to grade. So you definitely want to use letters to match. Um, but if you have really young children, you might be using those lines. Um, and then indicate if each response should be used once, more than once, or not at all. And it's a good idea to have to you have them use the responses more than once or not at all. Um, but if you write that in the directions, you have to make sure that sometimes you actually do that. Um, otherwise, the students will see through those instructions. So which one is better? Um, the top one or the bottom one? And of course, the top one's better because it's really clear to the students that they should be writing those letters in the boxes. Okay, another guideline. Um, use homogenous premises and responses. And we already talked about this. Um, and avoid putting lessons from different, <laughs> information from different lessons in the same item. This increases the level of difficulty. If you have the closer the items are to each other, the more difficult the item will be um, because they're having to make those smaller differentiations. Um, if, so it's easier to kind of differentiate between the dates in one battle versus dates for the entire Civil War. Um, it's easier, it's harder to kind of try to remember which scientist did what, but then try to remember who was the scientist and who was the president, who was the actor, right? So if you look at these examples, um, um, in this one, like if I, the Battle of Mexico, the Battle of Midway, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Battle of Bunkle Hill, the, the Tet Offensive. Well, I remember the Tet Offensive, it's definitely going to be something that was later on in time than like the Battle of Gettysburg. I know that was in the Civil War. So it's going to be easier for me to answer that question than to try to come up with all of these, the second example, all of these were during the Revolutionary War. So it's going to be, I'm going to have to really remember my Revolutionary War here history to answer that second question. Um, the next guideline, use four to eight premises. Um, if you have less than four premises, you should just make that a multiple choice item rather than making it a matching. And if you have more than eight, you should break it up into two matching items. When you have, when you have too many, um, it becomes, it becomes too, um, too long and too confusing. How many of you guys have ever tried to answer a multiple choice or a matching item that had like 20 different choices? It was just too long and it made it really difficult. It was tricky rather than difficult to answer. Um, so again, you can kind of see why that was maybe more difficult than it needed to be. Um, keep the responses ordered logically. So we want to make it easy for students when they know the correct answer to find the correct answer. You don't want students to be wasting their time trying to find the correct answer in the list. So you should put the names in alphabetical order and the dates in numerical order. So you can see um, in the in this example, in the first one it's really clear. So okay, I'm like, okay, I remember 
um, that um, Ray Bradbury wrote Fahrenheit 451. Okay, Bradbury, that's A. That's A. It's really easy to find, right? Okay. Um, keep the response item short. So again, when you have the left-hand column and the right-hand column, the way that a student answers is that they, they're going to read that left-hand column first, and then they're going to read all of the responses in the right-hand column. We want those responses to be short so the student can quickly read through those responses and then find the answer. So um, we want to keep that one short, and that's definitely something that I'm going to I'm going to be picky about. So if we can see in that top example, if I'm trying to find, so I'm looking for photosynthesis. Now I'm going to have to read all of those definitions every single time. It's going to be easy for me to get confused. It's going to take me longer. It's not an effective use of my time and it's going to disadvantage my English language learners and my students with disabilities. In the second example, now I'm reading that definition. Once I read the definition, I'm like, oh, that's photosynthesis. Let me find the photosynthesis in my list of col in my column. Does that make sense? So again, you want to try to make the longer definitions or the longer the longer um, of the two columns be in the left. What students are going to only have to read once. Okay. Avoid grammatical clues to the correct answer. So those are things like verb tense agreement, masculine and feminine pronouns. Um, those kinds of things. A and an is another one. So again, um, in this in this example, I have one person. This is like this is a first female in space. Well, in this example, there's only one female name. So it's pretty obvious that the only female name is going to be the first female in space, right? So in the second example, um, I left off their first names to make that difficult. Make that difficult raised just a little bit. My other option might be to add more female names into the list, but again, if there's only two females, then I've narrowed down those choices again. So you want to just be sure that you're not inadvertently giving kids clues to the correct answers. Um, put the premises and the responses on the same page, and this is something that I'll be checking for when you create your content test. Um, and just be careful how you're formatting the test that the entire matching question is all on one page. The easiest way to do this is to put your matching question first on your test. Um, so use more responses than premises. That way that they don't end up at the end with only one answer choice left to choose from. So you want to have more, more at the end so that there's always kind of one left over so that it's not a process of elimination. So I'm gonna, I want you to pause here, and with this example, I want you to try to come up with the, a, a list of the things that are wrong with this item and how I could make this item better. So you can pause it, jot down a list. If you're having trouble coming up with things, please email me. I'm happy to meet with you and talk you through this. Um, I find that students think matching questions are really easy to write, and they don't put the care and thought into that they should and then that creates problems later on. So make sure that you're just really careful in following the rules for writing matching items. And now I want to talk a little bit about um, your content knowledge instrument that will be due. Um, again, all of this information I just copied and pasted from the um, content knowledge instrument assignment that's um, on Canvas, um, but I wanted to talk it through with you as well because this is probably, this is um, an important um, assignment and I want you to spend time and think about it. Unlike the other instruments that you've created for this class, this one's going to take you a significant amount of time. I want you to put some care into it. You're going to do a peer review and you, um, it's more difficult than you would think, right? It's actually also going to be your Blackboard, dis your Canvas discussion this week. So you're also going to submit it to Canvas on, by Friday so that you can have some peer reviews of it as well. Um, so again, the first thing you're, is the goal of this is to measure content knowledge in your discipline. So think about what you want to teach in the future and make a, um, make a content knowledge instrument about that. If you're not sure what you're going to teach, you can pick any of the K through 12 standards to write about. Um, and then again, you're going to have four people take this test. Now it's a little bit confusing because, um, you can have whoever you want take the test. You can have, you know, your grandma, you know, your cousin, your kids, um, your roommate, your best friend. You can have anybody you want take the test. Even though you're designing it for a K through 12 student, 
you, um, you can have adults take the test. When you write up the lab report next week, you're going to write it up as if they were your student. So you'll pretend that the person taking your test was, you know, in fourth grade, even though they were 18 or 21. That's fine. Um, but for, so know that you're writing the test for a child, perhaps, but you can have adults take the test. So these are going to be your components. There'll be a rationale, a test blueprint, an instrument, and an explanation of the correct answers. And I'll explain each of those separately. So the first one is your rationale. This is basically um, you're explaining to me why you wrote this test and why you wrote this test the way that you were going to write this test. So um, the first part is the age and developmental level of your students, so the grade level of the target audience. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a minute too, but make sure that this age is second grade or above. We're not going to write a test for lower than second grade because I don't believe it's developmentally appropriate to give multiple choice tests to kindergartners or first graders. So, and I know they do it in schools, but we're not going to do that in this class. So second grade or above. And, um, but aside from that, tell me about your class. Is this going to be an AP chemistry class or a developmental algebra class? Tell me about that development level along with the age and obviously um, the content area as well. Then you're going to tell me the specific content standards. So you can use the Florida State standards, um, the Common Core standards. Um, if you are going to be teaching in a different state, you can use those state standards. You could also use the standards from a professional organization like the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics, National Art Educators Association. Um, if you wanted to teach psychology, you could um, go into the psychology standards. Um, that's up to you. Um, but it, it does need to be some sort of standards that you found, a standards document. And then from those standards, you're going to develop learning objectives. You should probably have between um, three and four learning objectives based upon those standards. The number of standards that you have might vary. For some of you, one standard, you can get three or four learning objectives just from one standard. For others of you, you might be co combining five or six standards into to make three learning objectives. It completely depends upon your subject area, your grade level, your content area. Um, when you write those standards, make sure that you write out the whole standard. Don't just say, you know, Florida Stan Sunshine Standard 3.5a. I don't have them memorized, guys. You're going to have to copy and paste them for me. And then provide a brief rationale for your for your test length. So tell me, you know, I only include 25 questions because I teach fourth graders and they have a short attention span, you know, but I thought 25 items would fully measure my construct. When you're thinking about this test, you're really thinking about an end of unit test. So thinking about, okay, this is the test I would give at the end of this unit to really measure the whole of the construct, right? So this isn't a daily quiz. This is really, you know, end of the chapter type of test, okay? Um, okay. And then you're going to create a test blueprint. Um, for this test, you need to have selected and constructed response items. So in the next, um, the next part of the module for this week, we'll go over the constructed auto, um, item types. So you'll learn how to write those as well. You do not have to have every single item type. So you don't have to have multiple choice and matching and binary choice. You just have to have at least one of those three. And um, this is what it would look like. So you can see here I have three different um, learning objectives and for each one I have a variety of item types so but look at that for the essay I'm only using I'm only using the essay to measure one of my learning objectives so you don't have to you don't have to use all of your learning objectives for every item type but you should create this test blueprint before you write your test so you should have an ahead of time what you think you want to have how many items you want to have on your test and how many items you think you need to measure each of your item types. Okay. Then you're going to have your instrument and this is this instrument should be formatted the way that you would give it to your students. So you for this test for this class this assignment you can have your instrument be a separate file because I really want it to stay formatted correctly for your students. So you can either take screenshots and embed it um, or you can make it a separate file but I want you to make sure you have things like a place for your student's name and make sure that the um, and a place for them to answer the questions and making sure that, you know, the matching question all stays on one page and those kinds of things. So make sure that it's, um, it's formatted the way that you would give it to students, leave plenty of white space. Um, pretend that you as a teacher have unlimited copies and can, um, and can photocopy, you know, a 10-page test if that's how long your test is, that's fine. 
Okay. And then the explanation of the correct answers, and this is the bulk of the assignment really. For each question, you're going to copy and paste the question, and then you're going to explain the correct answer. So tell me what the correct answer is, and then explain to me um, how you picked your distractors, what level of thinking you think it might be, um, and how this item might relate to the learning objective. If it's an open response item like an essay, tell me how you're going to score that item. You only need two or three sentences per question, but enough that you can tell me what you were thinking as you created that item. So as you're writing this, as you're putting together your, um, your content knowledge instrument, please let me know if you have questions. I'm happy to answer them. I'm really looking forward to seeing how you create these items. Um, and other than that, have a great day, guys. Bye.